Hello everyone, welcome to A plus BI. This channel is all about complex numbers and this video is the last one in the lecture video series on complex numbers. Now we're going to talk about pretty much everything we talked about quickly as a summary in this episode. And then after this we're going to start problem solving with complex numbers. I think this concludes the fundamentals and if there are more advanced topics I'll make more videos. All right, so let's see what we talked about. We started our first lecture video with a quadratic equation. Hopefully you'll remember if you've seen that. And then we ended up defining a number whose square equals negative one. And that number is called i. So i can be defined as the number whose square equals negative one. This kind of implies that i is the square root of negative one, but negative one has two square roots, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So a plus bi is a complex number if a and b are real numbers. a is called the real part and b is called the imaginary part of z. z is very common with complex numbers even though you can use other variables. You can also write a complex number as x plus yi which you'll see again when we start graphing things. Okay, so some special scenarios. If a is equal to zero, then we get z equals bi, which is called a pure imaginary number, or you can just call it imaginary. And if b is zero, on the other hand, we basically get rid of the imaginary part, and we get a real number, which implies that real numbers are also complex numbers, which also implies that it's a subset of complex numbers. Okay. That is the channel, by the way, make sure to subscribe and like and comment. All right, so the next thing we talked about was the conjugate of a complex number. If z is a plus bi, it's conjugate, which you read as z bar because of that little line, is a minus bi. There's something special about a complex number and it's conjugate because when you multiply them, you get a real number. And this is always, no matter what z is, you always get a complex, I mean, you always get a real number by multiplication. But not only that, you also get a real number by addition. If you add z and z bar, you get a real number, which also implies by Vieta's formulas that if you have a quadratic equation with real coefficients, the solutions can be complex. And if they are, they are complex conjugates. So they come in pairs. Make sense? I hope it does. Now pay attention to a squared plus b squared because that is going to come up later. Okay. Basic operations with complex numbers. In this section, we talked about how to add and subtract complex numbers, which is basically adding the real parts and adding the imaginary parts or subtracting them. With multiplication, we use the distributive property, but also make sure that you simplify by using i squared equals negative 1. And then by combining like terms, you end up with another complex number as a result. Division is interesting because what you do with division is you multiply by the conjugate. That's why finding the conjugate of a complex number is important, especially for division. By multiplying by the conjugate, you basically get rid of the complex number at the bottom, which turns it into a real number. In other words, like if, let's say, symbolically, if we have a plus bi divided by c plus di, if you multiply the top and the bottom by c minus di, the product of these two things gives you c squared plus d squared, which is a real number, and then it's basically the product of two complex numbers divided by a constant, and then it's just going to turn into another complex number. Make sense? Okay, great. That's how we do division. And of course, there's other ways which we talked about in the example section. The absolute value or the modulus of a complex number is very important because complex numbers cannot be compared. There is no ordering. So you can't say, hey, one complex number is bigger than another or greater than another complex number. You can't order them. But you can talk about their absolute value, which is a real number. And it's also denoted by r, or you can say or write absolute value of z, just like the real absolute value, but its definition is different. It's defined as a squared plus b squared 
under the radical. Now, remember I told you that this was going to come up. What did we see just uh, a little before? If you multiply z and z bar, you get a squared plus b squared. So if you multiply a complex number by its conjugate, then you basically get the absolute value squared. Make sense? So this is another important identity that will come in handy uh, while solving problems. And of course, the absolute value comes from a definition. It is the distance from the number that represents our complex number from the origin to the number. Okay? And our complex number a plus bi is basically the same thing as the ordered pair a comma b, as you can see. Uh, this is the first quadrant, but our number can be in any quadrant depending on the value of a and b. All right? So that is the definition of absolute value, and that's how you find it, and the result is always a real number, a non-negative real number. Great. So now let's go ahead and talk about another thing, which is called the argument and the trigonometric functions. Now when you plot a complex number, this angle is theta, which is the angle between the segment that is, connects the number to the origin and the x-axis. That's called, uh, that's by the way, that's a positive angle in the counterclockwise direction. The distance between the number and origin is the absolute value, and you can talk about some trigonometric values, such as sine and cosine. Now, this is also r, and, you know, the, by the way, sine and cosine doesn't have to be positive, so b and a do not represent length, just the coordinates. So in some quadrants, obviously, sine and cosine can be negative, and tangent is defined as b over a, which is sine over cosine in this case, and by using tangent theta, you can find theta, which is the argument, by using the inverse tangent function, which is also right as arctangent. But you got to be careful because the value of theta depends on the quadrant. If you're in the second quadrant, sine is positive, cosine is negative. And of course, by replacing these, like b with r sine theta and a with r cosine theta, in this expression, we end up with this, and by taking the r out, we end up with the polar form of a complex number. Notice, theta needs to be in radians. So this is a really nice form of writing a complex number, and we're going to use this a lot for solving problems. Now, Euler's formula is exactly what that is. e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta, which is something that you can prove using Taylor's series. Now, this should look familiar, because if you replace a with r cosine theta and b with r, r sine theta, you're going to get the following. So, this gives us a nice expression for z, which is super duper compact. z can be written as r times e to the theta, where theta is the argument and r is the modulus. So, pretty compact using e as a base, and now we're going to use this a lot again. In general, we can write it this way because you're allowed to add multiples of 2 pi, which basically gives you a multitude of values for uh, to represent a complex number. The Moivre, I could never say the French pronunciation, the Moivre's formula basically allows us, and by the way, n needs to be an integer here, allows us to raise a complex number in polar form to a power. And you could do that by raising r to the nth power and multiplying the argument by n, it's that easy. And that's actually a really cool thing. You can go ahead and test it out with 1 plus i raised to the power 100. And you're going to appreciate it real well. Roots of complex numbers. So we talked about powers. Now how do you find the roots? Like the square root, the cube root. One thing to keep in mind though, a real number has a single square root if it's positive or zero. But complex numbers have a number of roots such as it has two square roots, three cube roots, so on and so forth. So there are n nth roots of a complex number, which is given by this formula, which is kind of complicated. But don't worry, we've done some examples you're going to see in the lecture videos. The trigonometric functions are going to be the last piece, I think, in our lecture videos. And then we'll briefly talk about quadratics again. So we can remember Euler's formula allows us to write e to the i theta, Replacing theta with negative theta gives us the second formula, and then by adding and subtracting these together, we get sine and cosine. If you wanted to get the value of tangent theta from here, you can basically use sine theta over 
cosine theta. And then you're just going to simplify this a little bit by canceling out the twos and so on and so forth. Now, this is helpful, especially for solving equations like cosine theta equals two or to evaluate cosine i, which we just used in a video or I believe we're going to, yeah, we just used it recently, right? On my other channel, which is CyberMath. <laughs> Anyways, so these formulas come in very handy and you can also talk about the hyperbolic functions in this sense. And the final piece here, last but not least, is going to be the solving quadratic equations with non-real coefficients. So if you have an equation like x squared plus ix plus 3 equals 0, we can basically solve this using the quadratic formula, or you can complete the square, especially if the coefficient of x is an even number. And this is the end of the last video in the lecture series. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification bell, and stay tuned for upcoming videos. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.